Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. I welcome you all to the Hindu newspaper analysis for today. It's Wednesday at 8 p.m. live on our YouTube channel. You can catch the International Relations This Week episode number 94. Don't forget to join us live for this at 8 p.m. As you know, this is a series in which we discuss the most important news stories related to international relations from the last week or so. Now let's begin with the first article that is actually based on the ongoing COP27 of the UNFCCC. As you know, the UN members have all gathered in Egypt for the occasion of COP27, where the nations around the world are now making new promises altogether. What will we do in order to stop the climate change and in order to ensure that the global temperature does not go beyond the 2 degrees Celsius mark? Now, yesterday, it was the turn of India's Union Environment Minister, Sri Bhupendra Yadav, to make a statement in the summit. This is where he released India's Net Zero Plan. As you would know, last year in COP26 at Glasgow, the Prime Minister of India had actually made an announcement that is, India shall achieve net zero by 2070. Now, this was the time for India to now release a plan as in how exactly are we going to achieve this and what is it the way forward for us. Now, in this particular conference, India released its strategy document, which is a long term strategy to transition to a low emission pathway at the UNCOP. The document released by the Indian government says that India is aiming to expand its nuclear power capacity by at least three-fold in the next decade, which is going to be a big, big jump. Apart from becoming an international hub for producing green hydrogen and increasing the proportion of ethanol in petrol. Now, these are just a few of all the commitments that the Indian government has made. Interestingly, while all 195 countries were supposed to submit their long-term documents, those countries that have promised that they will be taking action against climate change. But in the end, only 57 have submitted these documents, which includes India as well. The strategy document is called Long Term Low Emission Development Strategy. In this strategy, the Indian government has actually mentioned how we have pre pawned our own target of ethanol blending to reach 20% by 2025. The document also says that we are putting a strong focus to shift towards public transportation and improving energy efficiency by perform, achieve and trade scheme that is a PAT apart from the national hydrogen mission, increasing electrification, be it for public transport or even for private transport as well. These are the key milestones mentioned in the Government of India's document. The national hydrogen mission of 2021 aims to make India a green hydrogen hub. Our ethanol blending target has been mentioned and highlighted. Also, that we will try to get our nuclear capacity up by at least three folds. Also, the government of India has highlighted this fact, the same fact that we have been saying time and time again, that only hold India accountable and responsible if the developed nations increase their climate finance. So yes, we have made promises to cut down a lot on our emissions, but all of that is dependable on how much climate financing are the developed nations actually want to give out to the developing nations. Because if we want to achieve this goal, it has to be at the cost of trillions of dollars. This trillions of dollars is a cost that the developed nations owe to the developing nations because it is a developed nation that have harmed the environment due to their rapid industrialization in the 19th and in the 20th century. The Indian government also said that our forest and tree cover are a net carbon sink that absorb 15% of the CO2 emissions in 2016, while we are now planning to increase it and have a forest cover that will be able to absorb 2.5 to 3 billion tons of additional carbon sequestration by 2030. We have updated our NDCs, that is a nationally determined contributions, and we have made it even tougher for ourselves by ensuring that half of our electricity will come from non-fossil fuels by 2030. Indian government has also said that no country apart from India is on track for such a pathway. Now over here, I would like to give a small clarification. This is the Indian government saying that we are the only ones who are on path to achieve our own NDCs. But if you actually do a Google search and you will see, there are various think tanks across the world that are tracking what are the other countries doing to achieve their own own promises that they have made in the Paris climate deal and usually they say that there are different groups of nations ones that are not doing anything 
दैट इंक्लूड रशिया ईरान एटसेट्रा देन देर आर दोज कंट्रीज विच आर जस्ट नॉट डूइंग इनफ इंडिया एक्चुअली फॉल्स इन दैट कैटेगरी एज पर मेनी इंटरनेशनल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन दैट इज फ्रॉम द साइड ऑफ द इंडियन गवर्नमेंट वी आर राइट ऑन ट्रैक टू अचीव ऑल आर टारगेट्स बट मोस्ट ऑफ द इंटरनेशनल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन दैट आर ट्रैकिंग द चेंजेस हैपनिंग आर नॉट इन अग्रीमेंट विद दिस a few countries that have actually been given a heads up by these organizations include switzerland gambia and some other small nations but nations such as india china have not been doing enough as per these international organizations now as you know india has continuously been updating its own nationally determined contributions these contributions are promises that the government of india has made about what exactly are we going to achieve by the end of a few years to help the world fight against climate change these are the updated list of those ndcs first the prime minister as you would remember some months back released the life movement life means lifestyle for environment this was inaugurated by the un secretary general coming to india if you remember this mission actually says that in order to fight against climate change we need to change our lifestyle as well only small changes in our lifestyle collectively can actually lead to such huge changes in the fight against climate change also the indian government is trying to achieve a climate friendly and much clearer path towards our economic development goal we'll reduce our emission intensity of its gdp by 45% by 2030 as compared to 2005 level we'll achieve 50% of our electric power from non fossil fuel resources by 2030 however that also is conditional on getting international finance from the green climate fund meaning that if this is not achieved the responsibility should lie with the developed world as well we are trying to create an additional carbon sink of 2 and 1/2 to 3 billion tons of co2 by having additional forest cover by 2030 we'll also try to have better investments in developing programs to fight against climate change in the field of agriculture water resources etc we'll mobilize additional funds not just being dependent on developed nations but other organizations as well and we'll build capacity on our own and research to bring in new ways to fight against climate change the next article that we have here is written from the point of view of the supreme court's recent judgment in the ews reservation quota as you know the supreme court recently upheld the 10% ews reservation in government jobs and education institutions the supreme court had said that there is nothing that suggests that this goes against the spirit of the constitution of india thus this reservation has been upheld now the author here is saying that the question of reservation is a very very complex question to handle if you look at the history of reservation you would see reservation is a kind of a remedy only just like the prime minister says we should not have ravi culture just like we have the political parties distributing freebies to the people even the reservations are a form of freebies only which is intended to target a certain specific population and it is hoped that the government in power while they are taking the decision would actually get help from these decisions so in a way reservation and these decisions are not very different as compared to the freebies in fact they are worse in the sense that while freebies may be once or twice but reservations keep on continuing year after year after year the other problem is when you have so much reservation when you have so much affirmative action that the government can make provisions in interest of so many classes then it defeats the entire purpose of reservation because now what you are doing is reservation in india now goes way way beyond 50% mark set by the supreme court so you are reducing the pie you are reducing the share of jobs from other people so in effect it will not be beneficial for the country because the problem is eventually the number of jobs in total remain the same it is just that you are now trying to decide who will get that job would a scheduled caste person get that job would an economically backward person get the job or would a general category student get the job but the problem here is that all the jobs together remain the same so india's growth in the long run will not happen the author is saying that rather than focusing on the question of reservation or who will get reservation government should focus on generating sufficient employment because if we have sufficient jobs if we have sufficient opportunities there will not be so much demand of reservation the reason why there are so much demand of reservation is that people know there are only finite number of jobs there are only fixed jobs and if you don't get it the other one will 
the only way for you to get those jobs because they are finite is that you should be given a preference over the others. This question can only be resolved if the government of India actually focuses on developing more and more jobs. Also, economic inequalities in India and around the world are actually increasing. So if you say that EWS criteria should be the criteria to actually get jobs to the people, that also cannot be the solution in the long run. Because you have to understand that the people who belong to the lower section of the society in terms of economic standing will only increase with this increasing gap between rich and the poor. If the government of India really wants to focus on having more economic development, we must ensure that the working age people in India, which are some of the largest number of people in the entire world, get enough opportunities, they get enough wages in the long run. Now, the interesting part is, if you actually see how the government of India has actually been making policies in the last few years or so, there is a new phenomena that has come up. Many economists actually call this the concept of jobless growth. Just a few months back, in fact, former governor of the RBI, that is Raghuram Rajan, in his lecture had also talked about the concept of jobless growth. Jobless growth is a situation where the country is actually growing economically in terms of GDP. If you see, barring the 2020 dip of the pandemic, you see that yes, the economy is growing. It might be growing at a slow pace, but it is growing. But at the same time, the employment is not growing. So you can see 2017-18, GDP growth 6.8, but employment minus 0.3. Then next year, GDP growth 6.5, employment minus 1.2. Meaning that while the GDP growth is being seen, the job growth is not being seen. This is called jobless growth. The main reason behind this is that the GDP growth does not take into consideration the average person's income. If, let's say, there's one rich person who is becoming very, very rich all of a sudden, while the poor people are still poor, even then India's GDP growth will increase because GDP growth is a collection of all the goods and services in the entire country. It doesn't take into account who is producing those goods, who are consuming those goods whether or not all the people in India are able to consume those goods or not. So GDP growth only cannot be the criteria. There can be 10 people very rich in India, 100 crore people very poor in India. Even then our GDP growth will continue. But our real focus has to be on employment numbers, which are very, very bad right now. Now, I want to bring your attention to why exactly is it that India is facing the issue of jobless growth. Now to understand this, try and understand how the countries grow. Now, developing nations, most of them, when they became independent, when they actually were able to get rid of the colonial power, most of them were agricultural nations. Now, usually the graph has always been from agriculture, the nations shift towards manufacturing. After manufacturing, they then go to service sector. India, however, has actually seen a direct jump from agriculture to services. We somehow have skipped the manufacturing sector in between. Now, the problem here is that out of these three, manufacturing sector is the one that is the most labor intensive, that employs the most number of people. Yes, services also employ a good number of people, but they require certain skill sets which are not easy to acquire since India's literacy is not great. That is why India is now seeing jobless growth. And this phenomena will continue unless the manufacturing sector actually comes up and starts employing people, which is not happening. Look at this data from the government. Manufacturing sector employed 51 million Indians in 2016-17, which came down to only 27.6 in 2020-21, which is a huge, huge drop in number. If you compare this with other nations such as Bangladesh, India has not even witnessed any export boom of labor-intensive products which Bangladesh has seen. Our poor system of education, poor on-job training means that people who are entering the workforce are just not skilled enough. Even for the GDP growth that we are seeing, as I said, the employment is not matching up to those numbers. One other big problem is that a lot of women in India are still being forced to sit at home or they have decided to sit at home rather than being a part of the workforce. They have rather taken up unpaid work at home, taking care of kids and elders, which is harming India in the long run. The next article that we have here is from a retired civil servant where he is talking about the right to education in India. He says, 
Since the 1980s, multiple initiatives have been taken in India and around the world to ensure right to education. In 1990, we had the World Declaration on Education for All. Even before that, in 1987, India had the Shiksha Karmi project to tackle lack of teachers in remote villages in Rajasthan. However, despite all of that, despite the right to education, despite the Sarv Shiksha Abhiyan, taking all of that into consideration, the fact still remains that India in 2021 ranked 132 in the Human Development Index out of 191 nations. That is when the Human Development Index takes into consideration the education levels as well. This indicates that India's education level is going downhill, which is a big, big, big cause of concern. He gives so many examples of 1980s of states such as Rajasthan, Bihar, where a lot of learning projects were started by the government, specifically to have collaboration from villages, collaboration from people outside the school also to be a part of learning. Local communities coming together, teaching the kids, but all of that has not really given the kind of result we were hoping for. In 1993, long before the right to education became a fundamental right, Supreme Court had said that right to education for children up to the age of 14 is central and fundamental. Thus, the Government of India launched a district primary education program in 1994 to improve the quality of education. Since then, many such programs have been launched, be it the Sarv Siksha Abhiyan, be it the right to education, but the fact remains that there is hardly any improvement in the quality of primary education. Yes, the enrollment numbers might have increased due to schemes such as a midday meal program, but in reality, the outcome of learning has not really improved. The participation of panchayats and community leaders in the schools is very, very low. The schools are mainly dependent on teachers and in the rural areas especially, there are huge number of teacher vacancies, which is why we have still not been able to fill in this gap. Many NGOs have tried to come up with solutions. There are NGOs such as the Central Square Foundation, Saksham, Gyan Shala, Room to Read, Akshara. But again, their reach cannot be compared to the reach of the government. And India right now needs a mass education program and not a program that only focuses on a few schools. Thus, we have to think about out-of-the-box solutions as per the author. Just increasing enrollment number with luring the students with food will not really work. If we really want to have educated people, learned people join our workforce, there has to be something done at the ground level. Now, although the author here only mentions a bit about why is it that societies, communities, panchayats are not taking a part in students' learning, I also wanted to give you an understanding about the other kind of issues that our schools are facing. I'm sure all of you are aware of most of these issues. First, foremost, inadequate infrastructure in schools. 12% schools in India have internet facility. Only 30% have computers. If you say that these are not necessary, do you know there are so many schools in India that don't even have proper washroom toilet facilities? Even if they do have this, there is no separate washroom for girls' students, thus discouraging them from coming to school. There is a high dropout rate also in primary and secondary levels. Most of the students from the age group of 6 to 14 leave the school before they complete education for various reasons. Maybe their parents ask them to join work and earn money for the family. Maybe they are not interested in schooling. Maybe the schools are just not good enough. But the National Family Health Survey has actually seen that not being interested in studies was the main reason given by 20% of the girls and 35% of the boys who dropped out of school. Thus, India is facing an issue of mass illiteracy. Again, I am telling you, please don't compare illiteracy with school enrollment. The school enrollment numbers are still very, very high because of the midday meal scheme, but the learning outcome, the literacy is still very, very poor. At the higher level, there is still lack of technical and vocational training, and that is why many of the students, even after coming out of colleges, first have to be trained again to find any jobs. As per UNICEF, poverty and local culture practices also play a big role in gender inequality in education. As I said, lack of sanitation across schools in India has discouraged girls to come to school in larger numbers. Also, since the article actually starts with a mention of Human Development Index, this is a recap of this. 2021, India stood at 132nd position as compared to 130 in 2022. 
almost the same, nothing to choose from. But yes, in all these cases, there has been a very, very disappointing performance by the government of India standards. As you can see, HDI actually is a geometric mean of life expectancy, gross national income and education. Education here means arithmetic mean of years of schooling and expected years of schooling in the country at that point of time. The next article that we have here is about the ongoing G20 summit in Bali, Indonesia. It was a very, very highly awaited summit where 20 of the world's most developed economies would assemble and discuss issues at a time when the world is facing a number of crises. The ongoing Ukraine-Russia war, increasing food inflation, increasing prices of energy and also the world still battling the question of climate change. As you know, G20 means these are the group of nations that account for 85% of the global GDP. 75% of global trade and about two-thirds of the world population. While most of the members will be here, some of the nations that did not send their leaders include Mexico and Brazil. Brazil because a new president has just come up, so it's in a transition phase. Russia is a member of G20, but as you can imagine, Vladimir Putin will not be here. He instead has sent his foreign minister to represent Russia. The motto of G20 is recover together, recover stronger. As you know, Next year, the G20's presidency will come to India. India will be hosting it. So as soon as the summit ends, India will assume the presidentship of G20. Now, G20 summit is not just about these nations coming together. It is also about having a lot of opportunities to have bilateral meetings. For example, it is in the G20 summit that Joe Biden, ever since he became the US president, had his first bilateral meeting with Xi Jinping. So US and China finally have met together one-on-one -on -one at the highest level because of this G20 summit. Usually, whenever these kind of summits happen, it is a host nation that decides on the agenda. This is why Indonesia has decided that discussions will happen over these pointers. Food and energy security, health partnership for global infrastructure investment and digital transformation. Thus, because India plays the host next year, next year's agenda will be set by India that will focus mainly on the global south, that is developing nations and its problem, and food and fuel shortages across the country. This is the first G20 ever since the Ukraine-Russia war began. It also marks only the second time that Xi Jinping has traveled outside his country after the COVID pandemic. First time, as you remember, was in the recent SEO summit. The SEO summit that was held, that was the first time he went outside China after the COVID-19 pandemic. This is his second such meeting. Now, G20's collaboration was actually a result of the world nations wanting to come closer to the G8 and OECD. Now, G8 in 1999 came up as a group of eight nations, the most advanced in the world. It is now G7 because Russia is not a part of it now. On the other hand, there was OECD nations. Now, while the OECD nations were much more widely accepted, OECD, as you know, stands for Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It has 38 members. There was supposed to be an organization somewhere in between to collaborate between the two. That is when the G20 came up. The G20 was a group that had much more representation. So remember, it does not just have only the nations. It has international groups as well. That is a G20. So there are representations from EU, IMF, etc. also which take part in the G20 summits as is happening this year. Also with respect to G20, do remember there is a word called Troika. Troika means three nations which are number one, the host nation, second, the previous president and then the next president. So next year when India plays the host, the Troika will be India, that is the present president. Indonesia, that is the past president, and Brazil, that will take over from India. For the first time ever in the history of G20, this Troika will all be of developing nations together, which is a big, big shift in terms of international politics. Now, do remember the member nation of G20. I know it's not the easiest thing to remember, but you need to because these questions have been asked in the past. Don't think that this is 20 member nations. Why will the UPSC asked this question. The fact is that they have asked this question in the past. So try and remember this as well. Now, Indian government has already put out what will be their priorities for the next summit when we host the G20. 
we want to be discussing on life that is the thing that we discuss the prime minister of india's own initiative of making changes in the lifestyle to ensure that we don't harm the environment we also will be focusing on women's empowerment tech enable development in agriculture education etc culture tourism climate financing green hydrogen has also become a key word for india where india is focusing very very aggressively and we'll also be focusing on fight against economic crime and multilateral reforms the next article that we have here focuses on eklavya model residential schools now as you know the government of india has been focusing on development in the tribal areas in many different aspects one key thing that they are focusing on is to build as many eklavya model residential schools as possible as the name suggests these are the schools that have to be built specifically in those areas where there is a considerable tribal population mainly to focus on the tribal children to give them education because education level amongst the tribal children in india is amongst the lowest in the entire country so the government of india has been pushing to set up 740 eklavya model residential schools for tribal students the idea is there has to be one such school in every sub district that has at least 20000 odd scheduled tribe population which is about 50% of the total population in that area although parliamentary committee and many experts say that this criteria of population alone should not be the criteria but the government said no we are fine with this and we are going ahead with this criteria only the concept of model residential schools for tribal students came up in 1997 to ensure high quality education to tribal students along with residential facilities itself where they would not have to focus on other expenses such as food etc and government will take care of everything the aim was to make them very similar to the successful idea of jawahar navodaya vidyalayas which are present all across the country in every district today kendriya vidyalayas also present a successful model of school run by the government of india funds for these schools will come through grants under article 275 which allows the government of india to give certain grants to the states for the welfare of the scheduled tribes the center government has also given guidelines to the state governments of how to set up these schools now in 2018 19 the cabinet actually revamped and made certain changes in the scheme the new guidelines say that union government will have more power to sanction the schools and manage them because union government apparently was not happy with how the state governments were taking forward this project the government also established a national education society for tribal students that will overlook the working of state education society for tribal students so that there is no implementation problem on part of the state governments also the new guidelines that were released by the cabinet in 2018-19 were actually debated and criticized by many for example the guideline that they gave was first about the population criteria that we just discussed secondly the new guideline said that there has to be a minimum land of at least 15 acres to set up these schools now this is where the problem has begun in reality the government's aim of 740 schools is far far away from being realized The reason is that in a lot of these tribal areas it is very difficult to find 15 acres of land all together to actually set up these kind of schools especially in hilly areas where you don't have these many plain areas also in areas which are affected by left wing extremism in the northeast part of the country it's difficult to find 15 acres of land suitable for schools but the problem is government is not budging on this and they are not compromising on this aspect the government also is realizing that there was a shortage of teachers as well the government has thus only had 4000 teachers against the requirement of over 11000 teachers the tribal affairs ministry also says that we are working on other districts as well where the population of tribal students may not be 20000 but they still require help from the government but the first priority is to first complete these 740 schools as targeted by the government the idea is that government initially had said that we will achieve this target of 740 schools in 2022 itself but now they have delayed it by 3 years and they say now the target will be achieved by 2025 26 and we'll also have many more teachers as compared to others it remains to be seen whether or not now this deadline is met by the government this in fact 
is today's Twitter. If you go to Twitter today, the Ministry of Tribal Affairs on their official account has posted this, where they are talking about how to improve tribal education in the schools across the country. They are talking about the Eklavya model schools and the other initiatives that have been taken up by the government. They have mentioned the similar kind of things as we have discussed. Target of setting up 740 of these schools, center of excellence to be set up for sports in these schools. As you know, amongst the tribal population, a lot of very, very good sportsmen actually come up. So government wants to realize their potential here as well. The government also says that 688 of these schools have already been approved, while construction for 230 has already been completed. All this data has come up from the side of the government itself. These are the important articles on the Hindu newspaper today. Now a couple of practice questions. Number one. Until India creates enough high-quality jobs, there will always be a rush for reservation in jobs. Critically analyze. Second, for the global south to honor their net zero targets, the developed world must own up to their responsibility and finance the fight against climate change. Comment. Both these questions have to be answered within 250 words each. Thank you for watching the video. Have a good day ahead.